plans. We all have them. Dreams, they start young, but then things happen. Big things, little things, tragedies, decisions that you make, they lead you down a path. And that path is facing the opposite way of your dreams. That path is facing failure direct in the face. My guest today has been there. He is two things, the most overqualified valet attendant in the world and the president of Ashland University. Success on many levels. Carlos Campo tells a story next. This is a dash of grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things. Now, podcasting from Spire to leaders in local communities like yours, here is Brian Leflock. And let's get cooking. So a little bit about myself that you may not know. I live in Ashland, Ohio. I love Ashland, Ohio. I love the people and I care about our little town so much. And I am a graduate of Ashland University. And so all of those things coming together are why I am so excited and so proud to be able to welcome my next guest for you. He's the president of Ashland University. And you now know why I built that up that way. It's so important to our community. It's so important to the students that pass through, the thousands of students that pass through uh, every year and through our town. And it's just a critical position in our community. And so Dr. Carlos Campo is my guest today on A Dash of Grit. Carlos, thank you so much for being our guest. We appreciate it. Absolutely, Brian. Great to be with you. Really looking forward to this. And I I can't wait to get into the grit. This podcast is all about hard times. Um, But I I know great things are happening. And I want you to talk about that a little bit. Can you give me some example of of really wonderful things that are happening for you and even for the university? Tell me about success. Sure. You know, we all measure success differently. When I look at Ashland University, I think about you know, a new vehicle or, you know, some, something that comes off an assembly line or is manufactured. It's a, it's a human being, Brian. And so when I think of our success, it's our alums. And of course I'd brag on people like you and your wife, a couple of alums Mm -hmm. who are touching this community. When I hear you open an interview and say, you love this community and you love Ashland University, I think to myself, boy, there's a great byproduct of what we do at Ashland. So I, I don't want to go on to any other single thing but to say I look at how our alums are touching their communities. And, and they, they're literally all over the world, as you know. Yes. And there is no other measure of success from my perspective of a great university. But I'd go on to say I'm really proud of the way Ashland has been intentional about reaching out to our local community. So there's another win or success for us. We've really become a trusted partner in the community and we want to be seen that way, you know, from the place where people go for culture and athletics and lectures and all of that. We want to be a vibrant part of our community. So those are a couple of successes. I do have to say that, you know, we have the longest running, just something you may not even know. We have the longest running correctional education program in the nation. Mm -hmm. Started in 1964. And we're going to open this fall with the largest correctional ed program in 10 states and serving maybe as many as 4,000 students. So I, I mentioned that as another emphasis on success because something that started with Lucille Ford, another icon in this community, and now has really blossomed that reflects our commitment to a broader student body. It's just another measure of success. So those are just a few of the few things that come to mind when I think about success in Nashville. And so important. Those, those, those kids, those young people, the young adults, the, the MBAs, the professionals, and even those in incarceration, they, they deserve this opportunity and they look to you for that success. And I I have a feeling that it's something you take very seriously, isn't it? We do. You know, I think that when I hear that four letter word grit, nothing to me defines kind of the Midwestern sentiment and an Ashland, a deep Ashland sentiment that that grit is one of the things that's led to success for so many of our alums. And I do point to those alums who have had that impact And we're, frankly, one of the few schools, Brian, that still has held on to this idea that values really matter, Mm. you know, that a great education is absolutely taking the the life of the mind and expanding someone's sensibilities. But it also doesn't miss the fact that we want to be known as people who can be counted on in their community, people who reflect the highest and best of the values that has, have made America great. So I think all of those things blend together to make Ashland the special place it's been. Yeah, I think so too. And, and, and so Carlos, I'm, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and preset this. You're the president of the university. That's an amazing position. And, it, and it's a pinnacle that many people 
just don't even have the dream of accomplishing. And so I know that when I ask you about success, you talk about Ashland University. I get that. I, I, I know that's baked into you. It's not about you. It's about the faculty and, and the people. But I want to talk about you because I, I think part of what I've been able to learn by doing this podcast, I talk with a lot of successful people and people think that it's just God given. It's just, you just are the president of the university. That's who you are. And it's who you've always been. And I don't think people think enough to realize that it hasn't always been that way. And so I want to talk a little bit about grit and I want to talk about your success and your journey from wherever it was that you started, wherever you want to start and, until now. And, and talk to me about the hard times, maybe when it wasn't so easy, the things that people don't see on the outside when they look at you, but that you know are part of you. Can you tell me some of those stories? Sure. Thanks, Brian. Well, you know, I'll share one story that's difficult to go back to, but when I was 17 years old, I was sure that I was going to follow in the footsteps of my parents who were both pioneers in American television. Mm. And they were they actually met on the Jack Parr television program, kind of the precursor to Jay Leno and Johnny Carson. All that to say I went off to school, well, actually to audition in a theater program at Carnegie Mellon University, a school you know well. And literally when I returned home the next day, my mother had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. Oh. Uh, literally su that suddenly, uh, just overnight. And here I am, a 17-year-old, getting ready for the adventure of my life, I think. And now suddenly my life has been irrevocably changed. So... You know, when I think about the fact that when that acceptance letter came from Carnegie Mellon, Brian, I knew I wasn't going to Carnegie Mellon. I, I stayed home, you know, cared for my 14-year-old sister, my dad and I, and the three of us were kind of together at that moment. But I say all of that because I never would have thought that the journey that's taken me to Ashland would have begun in that fashion because I, I was on a track. But really, you know, I, I continued to study theater as one of my English prostitutes said, you know what, I think you're talented enough to pursue a degree in English. And I shifted, moved into that track, stayed with it all the way through the PhD, and you know, then hit a really tough roadblock. And that was, I was in Southern Nevada at the time, and other than the university where I had gotten my degree, and as you know, it's very rare to get hired where you get your PhD. It's almost kind of seen as academic incest. They want to push you out of the nest and, and get you teaching or working somewhere else. There just aren't that many opportunities in that region. So I was really working hard to just get a break and get a teaching job at the local community college. And I will tell you, it almost became a routine with the few folks who had written me letters of recommendation that I'm trying to get an adjunct position, just teaching English at the local community college and couldn't get through. I'm parking cars. I'm working in restaurants. I'm doing the things that you do when you're a dad, as I was with three kids and a wife and trying to make ends meet. And there was a time, Brian, when I tell you, I thought I am certainly the most overqualified valet parker in the history of, <laughs> you know, but yeah. through all of it, you know, you talk about grit. I, I never lost the hope that I could break into higher ed and make a difference in students' lives. So, yes, I took that traditional track and, you know, it, it, it took many semesters and suddenly someone left the local community college suddenly. And I got the opportunity to teach and it set me on a track. And before long, I was a department chair locally. I became a dean in that community college and then uh, the chief academic officer. And uh, so it, it didn't happen overnight. And it definitely was a time. There were those times when I, oh my goodness, I have yeah. thrown away a whole lot of money and time. But anyhow, that, that's kind of the, that story and that journey that I think displays how our journeys can be so different. And I'm interested in, and in looking back hindsight, we can see, boy, I'm glad I stuck it out. I knew I could do it. And, and, and you can say those things, but at the time without the benefit of hindsight, was there a point where you just were ready to give up or try something different or just, were you ever considered it by your own self? I just, I failed. Did it ever get to that point? Oh, no question. No question. You know, I, I've often thought back, Brian, to think we too often define ourselves too much through our work. But it's just the reality, you know, I define myself so much through my work and hence saw myself as a failure, not being able to break into an industry where I'd spent so much time that I did feel that way. But I have three incredible sisters, a wife now of 40 years that have encouraged me and challenged me and basically said, you can do this. You're great. Just give it time. And so through, through their 
uh, determination, prayers, and you know all the support that they gave me through those years. They really helped me through that time. Yeah, and and if you don't mind me going back a little bit before sure. then, so we we go back and we we talk about Carnegie Mellon and, and the unfortunate, of course, passing of your mother. Yes. How much did that shape your desire to be in? What switched in you that you no longer wanted to follow that other path, and now you wanted to do this one that you are currently on? That's a great question. And I think one of the things that I saw, because so many of my family members, frankly, had been involved in theater, television, film, you know, it's a very different road. And it can be a very isolating road and a, and a road that is demanding in ways that really I, th- I felt like were at odds with the commitments that I'd made. So I was married. We had a young baby at the time. And I thought, you know, if my situation were different, there was a passion in me to follow that route. But I think that was the primary factor, Brian. I thought to myself, if you're going to be a great dad and a great husband, you probably need to look at other opportunities. And boy, the first day I stepped into a classroom and interact with, I thought I could do this forever. Yeah. And it became, and that was your passion. It was just waiting to be it was. bloomed. I don't know if that's a word. You're an English professor. Is bloomed accurate? I don't know that it is. (laughs) You know, in that context, maybe it was ready to bloom, I think would probably be it. Very good. (laughs) Very good. I I couldn't let that pass without uh, making sure. (laughs) So so I'm I'm interested then, you've got this position. And and we hear a lot in the world today, it's this thing called imposter syndrome. And it, it, it is the idea that I'm not good enough. I'm faking it. As soon as they find out that I'm in, was there ever a situation after you landed that first position and you were diving, you had just gotten back from being the most overqualified uh, valet and, and now you were in this spot and you're on your way. Was there ever doubt or, or boy, I don't know that I can cut this. Sure. I, you know, I, I will tell you that because I have always been blessed with incredible people around me that I've always felt like we can get this done together. But sure, I I often have felt, gosh, these situations, the challenges are so overwhelming. Do I really have this stuff to get this done? But I I would say they've generally been pretty fleeting. You know, I I have had terrific support around me, great people around me. I remember, you know, one of these presidential training sessions you go to, and a president once said, if I am sitting around looking at my team and thinking, I am the least qualified and competent person in this room. I have hired yeah, well. Yeah. And I've tried to take that to heart and say, you know what, if you get the right team around you and you support them well, you'll be fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that leads me to kind of my next series of questions. You've battled through things and now you're in your position, you're growing, and now you're the, the president of, of AU and you had your challenges all along the way. And I know in higher education, there's no end to the, there's financial concerns and there, I mean, all kinds of, of things that you're constantly dealing with. How do you address, how do you prioritize, how do you figure out, how do you manage all of those different things that come onto your plate? And even things like COVID that just come out, you're not even thinking about it. How do you lead through that? Great question. And of course, I'm going to go back to core values. I think it, at the personal level, professional, you always want to know what are the core values that animate everything that you do. And I think that's what we look to at Ashland, you know, those ideas of what is it that really moves you for this teaching excellence and this focus on character development, this accent on the individual. These are all things that help direct everything that we do. And I know it's one of the things that I find most specifically at Ashland. And yes, there are going to be challenges in the future. And the ground underneath us feels like it's shifting in ways that it never has before. But if that core stays firm. We believe that those elements will always be attractive to students and that students of any age, any background, any color. You know, we feel that if you do that correctly and you set forward, one of our earliest documents, I just saw it recently in 1939, we said we are, we have identified a culture of love and respect where we're trying to teach self-governance. But I'll tell you what, I don't want to stray too much from that foundation. That's not an easy thing to do. But if we look at every student and say, you have a purpose and a destiny, Brian, that's what we believe. And I know that this program very often focuses on that. It's what we believe. We then nurture in Ashland and in each student that opportunity to 
to be all the things you were created to be. And that's what we believe. How have you been able as a leader to, and, I, and I've talked with, with many leaders who talk about culture of their organizations and their businesses, mm-hmm. and it's about culture and making sure that everybody is on the same page, believing in the same things. And, and so the customers can do the same. How have you led through with the size of the organization, the scope of the issues? How do you know that the culture's always solid, that it's not in danger of being corrupted at some point along the line? One bad apple spoils the bunch. How do you lead through that kind of a, of a, of a need to make sure it's right? Right. Well, I think it is this insistence that these are the things that are the fabric of who we are. And we will not compromise those elements. I think that's the key for us at Ashland. We have talked about taking a third way. You know, we're not an overtly Christian school, but we have ties to the Brethren Church, as you know. But we're not a secular school either. We don't give up on the idea that character development and values-based education are important. So it's not easy to nuance that place in the middle where we think it's the right place for Ashland. This is who we've always been. So I think simply ensuring that everyone that you hire into the organization is clear on this is who we are. Does that align with who you are? Brian, every day we're out recruiting students, right? Mm. And it's about the fit and saying to students, this is the kind of university you will come to. Well, my goodness, if we are not doing the same thing recruiting faculty and staff in Ashland, that's the key to me. If you get that fit right early on, culture will follow. Yeah. And, and as you, as you do look towards the future, what, what, what is next? And then I, I want to ask it, AU has, has its own issues. And I want to talk about that. If you have an opportunity, mm-hmm. what's next for sure. AU and the issues that you're dealing with. But I'm also, I'm wondering what's next for Carlos Campo. What, what's one thing you haven't accomplished? What's something that you'd like to see for yourself in a matter of improvement or self-improvement or, or an actual, uh, something you put on your wall, you know, what's next for you? Well, that's a great question. When I think career-wise, I feel like Ashland is the kind of place. I've always been that sort of person that never sees a job opportunity as a stepping stone, yeah, Brian. I know. So I'm not looking beyond Ashland. I really want to invest in that. I feel like we are, Karen, and I are fully invested in the community and in the university. So I don't really have a career goal on my you know, bucket list that says I want to get to these things. Oh, yes, I do want to get to every single major baseball park in the country ah. and some outside of the country. So that's one on the bucket list. And I think, you know, one of the things I do want to see at Ashland is us to be able to respond to new ways of learning that are more into the digital world. I just think there are unbelievable and untapped opportunities that really paved the way, Brian, to more students being educated through an Ashland education. I think it's access. So that's on my bucket list. I want to create greater pathways for more students to become Ashland students and have them experience what you, your wife, and others have experienced. So that's certainly on our list, ways to ensure that we are available, if you will, to more students. Yeah, wonderful. And that's a great goal to have because the more folks that become Eagles, the better off, I believe, uh, all of us here, but everywhere across the country, like you said, and across the world are. So Thank you. very good. Thank so I, I, I uh, if someone's interested in, a, in Ashland University or maybe even specifically uh, for you, how would, how would you ask someone to reach out to you or to Ashland and, and kind of get in touch? Thank you. You know, we believe we are building on a strong foundation and partially because we get such great feedback. So it's easy to reach me at just president at ashland.edu. So just the word president ashland.edu and we try to respond to everyone as quickly as possible and we incorporate a lot of those ideas into who we are at ashland so thanks for that wonderful and thank you for for everything that you've done not just for for ashland university but for ashland in general we we are we coexist don't we and 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 uh, success for one is success for the other and and vice versa so it's very important. Thank so thank you, uh, Carlos Campo. Thank you, Dr. Campo, for being a part of, of Dasher Grid. It's a, a true honor for me and a pleasure for me. And I know that our listeners will appreciate the idea that it's not all uh, success. It's not all glitter and gold, that it's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of self-doubt and uh, overcoming is, is everything. So thank you so much for being a part of our show. 
Thank you, Brian. My honor. Thanks. So very quickly, I want to tell folks about, about Spire Advertising. It's the, the sponsor of this uh, podcast, and it was, it's what allows me to do what we do. Spire Advertising is a marketing company that helps businesses and organizations accomplish the next step and, and break through the ceilings and break through the, the hurdles that they're trying to to overcome. And if your business needs that kind of uh, support, that kind of help, we're here for you. You can learn more uh, at spiread.com. That's spiread.com. If you click the contact sales button, I will answer um, and I will look forward to doing that. I am Brian Leffelock, Director of Sales with Spire Advertising. Thank you again to Dr. Carlos Campo, the President of Ashland University. Uh, my alma mater, I'm thrilled. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This has been a dash of grit. Thank you for listening. We'll do this again. This is a Dash of Grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things.